A promise is a pledge to provide a service. I'm not promising you'll be entertained. I'm not promising we're the best show in town. What I am promising is to teach you biblical truth with practical application. I promise to teach men to fight for their faith, their families, and their futures through the word of God. I'm Douglas Gumby, lead pastor of the Contenders Church. Join us in the fight at contenderschurch.org. Uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 13, uh, today I will be teaching from verses 13 through 16. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, he says, Therefore I speak, uh, speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear and not understand and seeing you shall see and not perceive for this people's heart is waxed gross and their eyes are dull their ears excuse me are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed least at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and i should heal them but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear father i simply thank you for your word thank you god for those voices that you sent to remind us that it is you we worship thank you for reminding us that it is you we praise god as i give this word take everything that even i've written and planned out and and if you so desire to change it god you have your way holy spirit i move out of the way move doug gumby to the side that you may be glorified. It is simply this prayer I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I, I wanna use a, a, an old phrase uh, that, that we've all heard, those who plan to fail, fail to plan, plan to fail. Those who fail to plan. How many, how many haphazard people we got in the room? Don't raise your hand, that's embarrassing, don't do that. Uh, we kind of spur the moment, I can just go for it. But I, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer. Yeah, you can have those spur of the moment moments, but I think you just got to have a plan when it comes to life. If you're going to do something, do it wholeheartedly. Make sure that it is laid out. That's just me. That's who I'm created to be. Everybody's not like that. I'm not trying to make you me. I'm trying to make you a better you by teaching you the word. Those who fail to plan, plan to fail. Most business owners develop what is called a strategic plan to map out the future of their company's success. The, the Cellco uh, partnership operated under the name Verizon Wireless was the largest mobile phone service provider in America during 2002. Rated uh, best by consumers in customer satisfaction, Verizon was spending, watch this, an estimated $1 billion every 90 days to improve service quality and expand what is called their footprint. Verizon's smaller competitors were Sprint PCS and Singular Wireless, also known as now AT&T. Uh, they, the, their, smaller, their smaller competitors began price wars using lower price call plans and their footprint sustained call rates were lacking Subscribers using Singular were four times likely to drop calls. Amen, praise the Lord. Some folk in here still dropping calls. Choose your service wisely. Uh, <laughs> avoiding the price uh, wars completely and rebranding itself as, as a premium service provider, Verizon launched a campaign known as Can You Hear Me Now? Anybody remember that? That made me feel real, real old when I saw the date because it launched January 14, 2002. They came up with a strategic plan on how they wanted to gather more customers and they put money and resources behind their branding to make sure that their company was successful. They had a strategic plan. Well, I didn't come here to tell you about a strategic plan that I've come up with the gospel of Jesus Christ is the strategic plan. Unlike Verizon and other cell phone companies, 
We don't need to spend billions of dollars per quarter to improve quality service. We don't. What we need is qualified people who are willing to participate uh, to have the gospel deposited in their hearts, which in turn expands the footprint of what we are called to do. For the simple time that is ours to share, I want to speak from this topic, can you hear me now? Three things I want to talk to you about is in, in, in looking at this, this text, in looking at the approach of how we handle the truth of the gospel, three things I want to give you. Can you hear me now? Number one, I'm using a sensible approach. Jesus said, I'm using a sensible approach. In Matthew 13, in verse 13, he says these words, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see, they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. Have you ever seen something that you're looking at, but you can't really get the picture? Okay, let me paint a, bit, a better picture for you. Have you ever been given a riddle that's very simple once you find out the answer? But why are you trying to figure out the riddle? Like I saw one last night. They had numbers zero through nine. And it said, in these numbers, if you remove one letter, it's, the, the number is an odd number. If you remove one letter, it becomes even. Well, if you remove the S from seven, it becomes even. But looking at numbers, they're asking you to move, remove letters. It's a complexity in our minds. What we have to do with the gospel is take away the complexity of the gospel. The gospel is really, really simple. We have made it complex by making requirements on people that are not required in the word. You can say amen or out, it's okay. What I realize is this, a parable is a shell. It so serves a twofold purpose. Jesus said and basically that a parable is a shell that keeps good fruit for those who are diligent in researching what it's saying. Like we can go into the scriptures and we can just read scripture and some folk will say, Oh, I don't get it. And they turn the page and go find somewhere that, we, that we're blessed. But the blessing is in when we go after scripture for understanding, saying, God, I don't get it, but help me understand. A, a parable is a shell that holds good fruit if you're diligent. But it also can be a complex maze for those who are lazy. A parable can be that thing that says, I really don't want to do this. I just want to come to church, have the preacher preach to me, maybe spit on me from the second row, and, and call that anointing. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was one of the moments. Jesus tells his disciples that he preached by parables because the things of God were made more plain and easy to those who are, check this out, willingly ignorant. Do you believe that? That even today in the church society, I'm not talking about the world, I'm talking about us. There are those of us who come to church who are willingly ignorant of the things of God. We don't want to know the complexities of God. We don't want to search out the deeper things of God. We want to be spoon-fed and we want to be cradled and we want to be held and we want to be cuddled. But this is not a cuddling, cradling gospel. This gospel is to be given to those who are bold enough, brave enough, crazy enough to go and tell somebody else that a man, that, that God came down, put on a man suit, died for us, and went back to heaven, and he's waiting on us to tell the story of what he did. <laughs> Willful ignorance is the state and practice of ignoring any sensory input, anything you see, anything you hear, anything you can touch. We ignore the sensory input that appears uh, to, to contradict what is our own internal reality. <laughs> this causes people to seek facts that match their pre-existing views. Okay, you think I'm lying, I'm gonna make this make sense. This is gonna make sense to you in two seconds. 
Have you ever heard a person come to church, they love the church, they hear, they hear the same word you hear, but it's this one thing that the preacher is saying that the gospel is requiring that we just can't get. So we find a reason because it don't agree with my spirit. And I've heard that so much that when I hear that, I automatically know you already had your mind made up because you didn't want to hear the truth. It causes people to ignore information that goes against their view, both positive and negative. It differs from the standard definition of ignorance, which just means that you are unaware of something. Willful ignorance means that you know the truth. You see the truth. You've heard the truth. You can put your hand and your thinking on the truth. But you say, I don't want to deal with the truth, so I won't be bothered. Willful, ignor willfully ignorant people are fully aware of facts, resources, and sources, but refuse to acknowledge those facts. Because some perceive life this way, the gospel is treated as a savior to some and a method of death to others. The church do too much. What are we asking you to do besides help you get your life together? What are we asking you to do other than to help you stop sinning? Why is it that you, you, you got questions on the things that the church teaches you from the word that causes you to sin less and you want those things because that's what you're feeding your flesh that's what you're giving yourself you're not giving yourself wholeheartedly to the word you can't let me let me go on and say this you can't wait till sunday till i study and teach you something Go back in last week's message, and, 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 and the scripture said this, that you don't need a man to teach you what the Holy Spirit can teach you. But if you don't open the book, if you don't get in the Word, it's not going to get inside of you, and you are going to be a carnal Christian. And that's an oxymoron, because you can't be carnal and a Christian at the same time. Matthew 13. Uh, verse 10 and 11 simply says this and the disciples came and said unto him why do you speak to them in parables and he answered and said unto them because it is given unto you the know to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given Jesus said I'm revealing to you what everybody else doesn't know what they are not aware of they see me they've seen miracles they followed me they were intrigued by me but they ignored the fact that the folk who they saw blind could now see. I would be dumbfounded. My, my daddy was in a wheelchair. My dad was in a wheelchair, and I would be dumbfounded knowing that he had a bullet still lodged in his spine and two others that had been removed. I had watched him in a wheelchair all my life, and Jesus came along and got him up out the wheelchair. I would be a fool to keep my mouth closed. I couldn't afford to be willfully ignorant if Christ had done all that he had done for them. Had he done it for me, the disciples would search into parables and yearn to unravel its mysteries. They would ask questions. That's, that's what I'm trying to get us to do. Don't, don't just sit here and take my word for it. I'm not perfect. I'm not Jesus. I teach Jesus, I preach Jesus, but I want you to have questions about what I teach, not to question what I'm saying, but to validate what he has said to you. Jesus was saying to the, uh, of, of the others, those people, he said these people are willfully ignorant of the truth. These people are but yet babes, even in Christ. These people must be taught uh, by such plain comparisons, these people are incapable of receiving instructions any other way. So you got to make it fun for them. You got to make it relatable for them. When the gospel is plain and simple, it's, it's cut and dry. 
but you got to add a dance to it. I can't dance no more. That's all I do. <laughs> Though they have eyes, they don't know how to use them. The carnal hearers relied on bare hearing and would not be diligent enough to look further nor ask the meaning of parables. There are eight parables recorded in this chapter knowing the mysteries helps the hearer understand the purpose of the parables. Eight parables just in chapter 13 alone and Jesus stopped in the middle of them and said I speak to y'all in parables I'm giving y'all stories because if I said it in plain you would ignore it can you hear me now I'm using a sensible approach not only am I using a sensible approach but now I'm going to address the true issue I'm going to address the issue. Matthew 13, verse 14 and 15, the first part simply says this. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, by hearing you shall hear and, and, and not understand. And seeing you shall see and, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have clothes. I, I, I read that and the first thing came to my mind this week are, are these words. A warning is no longer a warning when the repercussions have started. The Bible is clear. At the end of the day, this is what we know as believers. Christ is coming back soon. Now, as I stated a couple of weeks ago, the, the, the commodity that we all have but none of us have control over is time. Ecclesiastes says to everything, there is a season, there is a time under heaven. We've all been given time. Matter of fact, we've all been given a time frame. The problem is we can no longer continue to live in time or our time frame like we have a positive future Tomorrow, we could, one of us could, any, any one of us could run out of here and have an accident and die today. Because we don't know our time. So we are, are charged to manage our time. That is why the gospel, teaching the gospel is so important to the believer and the unbeliever because none of us, whether we believe or don't believe, or whether we are believers or agnostic, we, we don't know how much time we have. At the end of the day, all we know about our time is it's going to end and Christ is coming back. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour. A warning is no longer a warning when the repercussions of those warnings begin. Isaiah, the evangelical prophet, says this. He spoke the most plainly about gospel grace. He foretold the contempt of the gospel of grace. He cautioned the people about the consequences of their contempt of the gospel of grace. What does that mean? That you can come to church all day, every Sunday, 52 Sundays. If Sunday falls on a leap year and it's the last Sunday, that's 53 Sundays. You could come to church, hear the truth every Sunday, and ignore it. Walk out of the door and live your Monday through Saturday night life like you never heard Christ. And I say that and we don't think about that, but the scary part is people do it. Every day, every week. Isaiah's prophecies were re referred to no less than six times in the New Testament, which helps us make this connection that in gospel times, which includes our times, that spiritual judgment would become common. That people would not be afraid to be judged by God. That's exactly what that says. That people would, that, 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 that spiritual judgment would be handled with less impact. Yesterday, the, 
the, the, the ladies came in and they had the, their little session and one of the things that the officers said uh, when, when, when asked about how handling young people and, and parents, when the parents are, uh, support the young people even in their wrongs, it, it flows right along with spiritual judgment and how we handle it in the church. Because here's the thing, if a child is wrong at school or anywhere else gets caught, the parent cannot afford to come in and take the side of the child. The parent has to be a parent 100% of the time. And if that child is wrong has to lay down the law on that child but see here's the thing I'm gonna look at you because I'm nervous to look anywhere else the, the, the truth of the matter is this we treat God like he's our buddy we treat God like he has no power to judge us that he's all caring and all loving and he's just the most amazing you're an awesome God You're a mighty God. And we go to God like he's our friend. I am a friend of God. And that's all lovely, but here's the thing. We cannot afford to live our lives as if God is our friend and he's going to look over our mess. One day, the very God who has been friendly and just and kind to us will be seated on the throne of judgment and that very friendly, kind, and just God will become a judge and he's going to look at you and say, in front of me, because you viewed me as a friend and not as an authority figure, you did what you wanted to do. You really didn't want to know me. You just wanted to be affiliated with me. The prophecy spoken of the sinners in Isaiah's times were fulfilled in the sinners of Christ's time and is still being fulfilled this very day. While the wicked uh, heart of man keeps the same sin, the righteous hand of God inflicts punishment on that sin. Christ does two things. First of all, he gives us the description of what willful ignorance looks like. A sinner's willful blindness and hardness, which is our sin. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I, I normally don't do this, but I'm going to do this. Everybody got they, they sin. You know what your sin is, right? I put my hand up first. Right? You, you know what your sin is? Good. You know what your sin is? You, you, know, what your, you, know, what, you know that thing that drives you, that, that you, you can't get rid of, you try put it down and pop back up. You, you know what that is? I put my hand up. You can put your hand up if you want to. Okay, got three, five, seven, two. All of us have seen it. Okay, so you know what your sin is, right? So knowing what that sin is, here it is. It's going to afflict us. It is going to come after us. It is going to chase you. It is going to lead you. It is going to grab your attention. That is a definite, but here is the kicker. You have, have, you have to live your life knowing that it's coming. You have to live your life. It doesn't matter what your sin is. See, in the church, we just talk about homosexuals and lesbians. That's because that's an, that's an abomination to, to the Father. Then we want to be holy. But we don't want to talk about us lying and cheating and stealing and, <clears throat> and all that other stuff. We don't want to put that on the table. We don't want to put being conniving. We don't want to put backbiting on it. We don't want to put the things that we do to our brothers and our sisters. We don't want to put that on We just want to talk about the big sins. I know it's quiet here, but there are people in the room. Let's see, there they go. Uh, Christ talks about, and he gives a description of willful ignorance. He says the people's hearts are wax gross. Have you ever just let a candle burn? Now, the funny thing is now they're selling it as a burnt, waxed over candle, and it's, it's selling for money, but it's basically a used candle that people are buying. But that, 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 that burnout wax, that used wax is what Christ is saying that people's hearts look like. They, were, they are usable. They are still usable, but now they've become comfortable with the gunk and the goo and all of the stuff falling off of them, and they learn to make beauty out of what I didn't create them for. We, 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 we look at our lives 
and we become spiritually fat. We become spiritually locked in that, that everything is about us. And most of the messages, the preacher don't preach about how I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to find another church. I'm not here to talk about your blessing. I'm here to keep you from dying and going to hell because it exists. But we want to we wanna feel comfortable. We want we to, you know, I, I need you to sing three wonderful songs and just take us into the presence of the Lord and, and just lead us and guide us into his presence every day. I can't do that. I'm not required to do that. I am required to tell you that if you don't live according to the word of God, if you don't look at your life and say, I've got issues in my heart, God fix them, that I am at risk of an eternity without him. The people's heart is waxed gross. The people's heart is fattened, which is a sign of sensuality, which is a sign of senselessness, meaning that they, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear the truth or they don't want to. This is what willful ignorance looks like. These people are called Jeshurun. In Deuteronomy 32 and 15, you can go and read that for yourself. They were an upright people. They were a seeing people, but they lost the reputation of both knowledge and righteousness for, for their indulgence in their own seeing. I, I know I got stuff that comes at me. I, I know I have stuff that I'm, 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 a, I'm a, I, sometimes I'm a willing participant in my own seeing. But this is what I know. Although it comes, and when it comes, I have to be strong enough to say, God, you be glorified. This is, this is the challenge of the believer. Paul said was given to me, this, this thorn in my flesh, this messenger of Satan, this thing that, that haunts me, that I can't get rid of to remind me that I'm imperfect and none of us want to be imperfect but the truth of the matter is we are i'll say this keep this in mind when the heart is heavy the ears are dull of hearing when the heart is heavy the ears are dull of hearing when when we have all of our heart's desires we cease to hear from god that's been the mo of the church for the last 25 years before we were broke, before the money came, before the houses came, before the things came, the possessions came, we sought God because we wanted to hear from God. I remember when the church used to have lock-ins. They used to come in on, 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 at a certain time, on a Friday night, and they lock in, and they wouldn't let go to a Saturday night. And, and we used to lock in for this one reason, because the people needed to hear from God. There wasn't a whole lot of preaching. There wasn't a whole lot of singing. It was folk laying on dirty, nasty flows, prostrate, saying, God, speak to me. Now, we got to cut church down to an hour and 20 minutes because you got stuff to do. So we got we to gotta figure out how to manipulate. It ain't everybody. I'm just saying a general statement. General statement, it ain't you because you here. But we got, we got folk who have this microwave mentality that we've got to address you quickly. We only got 15 seconds to address you on a video on Instagram. We only got 15 seconds to address you on social media. So we got to stab at you to get your attention to tell you how good God is when you ought to want to come to him because he's good. When the heart is heavy, when the heart's desires have been met, the ears are dull of hearing, and we can cease from hearing from God. That we can cease from hearing the whispers of the Holy Spirit, and they cannot be heard. The loud announcement within the Word of God are, are closed to and silenced to us. They do not regard, nor do they, are they affected by what the word says, yeah, 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 I heard it before. That's the image of a person who is willfully ignorant. The best thing you can do 
for a person who is willfully ignorant is leave them because we leave them alone because they are resolved to be ignorant they are resolved that they don't want to hear the truth they shut both their learning senses their eyes and their ears they refuse to hear truth they are resolved that they would not see light come into the world even if it was Jesus secondly Christ gives a description of judicial blindness which is the just punishment of shutting off the learning senses by hearing you will hear and not understand you won't understand the manner of grace and the message of grace you won't understand the amount of grace and its purpose to you the saddest condition a man can be in is on this side of a hellish eternity living on this side having hell on this side because I refuse to hear truth the Bible says this that one day that they are that those who don't believe I can't make you believe you got to choose you got to choose you got to choose to believe those who don't believe they will be set off into a place where there will be wailing weeping and gnashing of teeth that they will be gritting their teeth at God not able to die in an eternal flame now we don't preach that no more because you know it's not it's not politically correct you don't have a hell to put me in but God does and your decisions can allow that and my job is to help you make the decisions to get you away from this to get you to this to get you to him can you hear me now I'm using a sensible approach C can you hear me now I'm trying to address the issue and lastly let's establish a new connection let's establish this new connection Matthew 13 verse 15 the second part and verse 16 I'll go down to the second part lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear the believer ladies and gentlemen is saved from destruction because of favor we don't deserve the believer is sustained from daily attacks by new mercies that are presented to us in different ways all those who are truly converted to God will with certainty be healed by God that means that when that sin approaches you because you have converted your life because you have made changes in obedience to his will when that sin comes it is not a, a turmoil but is now a testimony if they be converted I shall heal them and I shall save them Jesus says in other words if a sinner died holding on to their sin I'll look at you God cannot be held responsible let me see let's make this make sense I make a decision my sin is gonna keep coming at me I know my sin is going to keep coming at me and I continue to make the same decision knowing what I know about God's grace, mercy, and, and, and what he feels about me. I'm treating him as a friend as if he's going to overlook me in my sin. So if I treat God like a friend and I expect him to overlook me, which that's what his grace does. It allows us to be, to, to be here and deal with this. But at some point, I've got to say I'm sick and tired of dealing with this, and God, I'm ready to let it go. I've done all I can. Take it away from me. So as he takes it away, it, it is our responsibility to avoid that sin. It is our responsibility to walk away from that sin. 
if we make the decision to keep going and keep trying and keep testing the limits of grace and mercy, at some point, here's the scary part, grace won't be sufficient anymore. At some point, mercy is going to run out. And my biggest fear as a believer is that I'm tempted by my flesh, no matter what that is, and I'm caught in my sin when my grace run, my, no longer is effective and my mercy has run out. And I die in my sin, I can't blame God for my decisions. Does it make sense? God would be justified to deny his grace to those who refuse his proposals and resist his powers. The individual who fully, foolishly expected to be healed without being changed spiritually is totally responsible for their unchanged heart. Let the church say amen. Hmm. We have been given a gift that not many people understand. The gift was made available to all, but only received by some. We who were effectually called to be his disciples must truly desire to be taught. I, I, I felt weird these last few years because I've been in a churchy environment. And, and that makes sense. I've been in a situation where you got to say things to get a response, a call and response in a church setting. That's what we were, that's what I was taught. And so in being taught that, I always look for a response. But I didn't understand that the response doesn't mean that I'm teaching. The response does not mean that the people are growing. The problem I had as a leader, as a, as a, a follower of Christ, was sending mixed messages. Yesterday I said these words. If the message is mixed, check the sender. Check the messenger. There's something in my life. Some of us are still dealing with this, trying to help other folk who ain't dealt with this either. We've got to resolve this in our own lives before we are effective, effective, effective in, in helping anybody else. The disciple of Christ must desire to be taught about him. He was more than just hung on a cross, got, got down, and got out of a grave. You got to know who he is. He taught in parables for those who don't understand but who need to understand. He made it simple for us so that we can make it simple for others. You must long to be instructed must be made to grow in knowledge by these parables and especially when properly expounded. Those who fail to plan, plan to fail. And unlike a cell phone company, we don't, we're not going to put billions and billions of dollars into expanding our footprint for some kind of tower. We're not going to put billions and billions of dollars into an edifice when the people are who we're supposed to be building. You are the church. It doesn't matter, and I've said this before, where we are. We can leave from here and go to a hotel room and you will still be the church. We can leave from here and have service in the parking lot and you will still be the church. My job is to build the church of Jesus Christ. My job is to make sure that the church has Jesus in the church. This is just a building. I'm not impressed by buildings. What I am impressed by is those who desire God. If I can get God in your, in your thinking, if I can get you to see what his word says, if I can get you to hear what his word says, then that word will get into your senses. You have opened the door for God to teach you, train you, walk with you. Now my, my passion for you is that you begin to question who God is in your life because go, the way God is to me, he's not going to be the same for you. He's definitely going to be different. 
the footprint is going to be spread because the church has a footprint. Because you have been built up on your most holy faith. Can you hear me now? Am I speaking loud enough now? Is it loud and clear to you now? Or are we going to sit here like those who are willfully ignorant? Hear the word. See the message. And ignore both. We have a responsibility. It's more than me just standing up here preaching. That ain't it. My responsibility is to you. Your responsibility is to this gospel. And our responsibility is to God. That's what we're here for. That's why we come together. To be strengthened. In the next few days, I, want, I, I need you. There, there's a, a flyer that we, we have up for our Bible study. I want you to ask questions. I want you to be a part of that for this reason. I want you to be a part. I want you to ask questions because I want you to know more. Because our goal, we got to be... We have to be strategic in our, in our evangelism. We have to be strategic in going out. In the next few weeks, we're going to have an invite to a, a community, and we're going to invite them here, not inside the building. We're going to meet them in the parking lot. I'll let you know about that real soon. We're still talking about a few things. But I need people who are receptive to the gospel so that when they show up, you're not looking at the outward appearance. Some of them going to be smoking. Some of them going to be cussing. I'm just letting you know. Uh, some of them won't be dressed for church at all. Well, most of them won't at all. So I need people who understand the gospel, who understand the good news, who understand that it's not about what you have on the outside. As long as I can get God on the inside, he will fix what is on the outside. Can you hear me now? Father, I bless you. Lord, I simply thank you for who you are. I thank you for teaching us to be strategic in the call of the gospel, for going after those who you chose, not who we chose, who we think are deserving, but God, those who you know are, are deserving, or even those who are undeserving of the grace and mercy that you extend, but you still chose to give it to them as you've done it to us. God, let the gospel now go into our hearts let it now sink into our minds. Let us ask questions of the stories that you've given so that we understand the kingdom of heaven, so that we can pass on the goodness and the grace and the mercy that you've extended to us and give that to others. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the life that you've given us. Thank you for the resources that you are to us. Thank you for the being our source and our strength. We give you all praise. We give you honor. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Bye.